now she is of sucking top, a tempting ride of flesh broadcast, delight exquisitely contrived, the dark beacon cinders underfoot. This is about my early introduction into uh, <laughs> my early introduction into natural history by my dad when I was about four. It's called The Early Bird. It's about a song thing. I'm five. Airlifted by my dad, waist high, to peer into a privet hedge against the sunny morning light. From what's revealed, I'm drawn to life. A throstle's nest, he smiles. Some thrush, I saw the hen just now, recalls dry husks collected by his grandfather. Date labels all pre First World War, spent shells preserved on cotton wool in shallow drawers. He sits me shoulder top to gaze inside a perfect hemisphere of mud as smooth as melted chocolate, straw and waffle lined. As a centerpiece, five Easter eggs reflecting festive flawless sky, adorned by negative of stars light years behind. This is about me mum and dad. You have to sort of tiptoe around me dad. I never got to the bottom of it. The other generation wouldn't tell. But he had some sort of breakdown when he, when he was very young. And so uh, he was slightly difficult. My mum was the opposite. She kept things going. But she did have one sort of piccadillo, reminding when, remembering when she tried, a, a, a band conductor tried to pick her up at a dance month, which, which she never forgot. <laughs> She never took advantage of it either, apparently, but anyway. Here we go. The final time she moved, we sorted through to shed the implements he hid behind throughout their life. His vice to grasp all things mechanical, that was his therapy, intolerance in almost beyond belief. His love the cross he couldn't share, he looked, dissected, tinkered till he understood. He damaged feelings deep inside before I came, so didn't deal with people well. I know how proud of us he was, but cogs and wheels on overdrive it didn't show. No details, but to repair, she wouldn't tell. And now him. Sorry, now her. The conjurer behind closed doors, she mine, me hers, she scrubbed on mangled family life, starch white, stem tears, iron creases out, darn holes, makes money, stretch the week. Her present tense is all I know, consumes her to accept obsessively with age, school friends she worked with till she wed. They soar as light as air, their petticoats lined bubbles in champagne. Good Catholic girls, ballroom the rage, the sacks out plays his luck. She's good enough to go professional. Bait, line and hook, she shies from at the time, sustains her all. end with a, a thong, another thong. Uh, I should apologise to Woody Guthrie for this, but I'm not going to because he actually pitched the tune and the framework of the song anyway uh, for, um, uh, from a, a popular ballad of the time. Uh, he called it this land. I call this this England. And it's a celebration of what it should be to be English. This land is your land, this land is my land, from seven sisters to Holy Island, from North Broad to Derwent Water, this land was made for you and me. From Crystal Trout Stream to Mighty River, from Wooden Footbridge to Blackwell Tunnel, 
from Northern Fellside to Chalk Hill Blue, South Down. This land was made for you and me. This land is your land, this land is my land. From Seven Sisters to Holy Island, from Norfolk Broad to Derwent Water, this land was made for you and me. From ancient stone, hence to the Avon Angel, from Paddy's Wigwam to Wren's Cathedral, from Temple Hill to Glastonbury Tall, this land was made for you and me. This land is your land, this land is my land. From Seven Sisters to Holy Island, from North Broad to Derwent Water, this land was made for you and me. From Thomas Telford to Bob MacAlpine, from Geordie's Rocket to Brunel Lionecraft, from working folk who shaped with iron hand, this land was made for you and me. This land is your land, this land is my land. From Seven Sisters to Holy Island, from North Broad to Derwent Water, this land was made for you and me. From Boudicca to Women's Suffrage, from Lever to Tall Puddle Martyr, I hear their voices on the wind. This land is made for you and me. This land is your land, this land is my land. From the Seven Sisters to Holy Island, from Norfolk Broad to Derwent Water, this land was made for you and me. Not just those rich bucks in their fine houses, stock markets, spits and merchant bankers, the people sing out loud and clear, this land was made for you and me. This land is your land, this land is my land. From Seven Sisters to Holy Island, from North and Broad to Derwent Water, this land was made for you and me. Each one of us who's made our home here, no matter when or where we hail from, join with me now and raise these rafters high. This land was made for you and me. This land is your land. This land is my land. From Seven Sisters to Holy Island, from North Broad to Derwent Water, this land was made for you and me. <laughs> Second printings of this on offer tonight. It should be eight pounds fifty. I'll give you for seven quid because it's a Buxton festival. So if you want to buy one, don't be shy. Um, it won first prize in a, um, a, a literal poetry competition. What competition? Okay. Thank you. I know I said I wasn't going to introduce everybody, but um, I know. thanks for being here for arresting on a super spread. <laughs> introducing his, his book because I was asked by a number of poets to, to say that they had uh, material for your perusal and your uh, purchase if, if you enjoy their material. So uh, this has given me the opportunity to say that. Actually, it might work better if I just introduce each one. <laughs> <laughs> so um, uh, I think that's. Uh, oh, oh, the other thing I should say, and I'll remind you again at the end, is we've got a couple of donation boxes because we're pleased to be able to put on a free show for you. But um, obviously there are costs involved, so uh, if you enjoy it and you want to put a few pence in the, in the box, that'll be great. Um, next one up is Randy Hawkins. Hi, so um, I wrote poetry all my life, kind of, and it would stick in a drawer or be on a computer drive somewhere, and I never would show it to anybody for anything in the world as we could. And then in 2017, I said, I wrote this poem and I'm going to read it in front of actual people. And I brought it tonight because the first time I ever read a poem in front of people was Bucks and Spoken Words up the road when uh, Julian Cohen was leading it. So I brought that the same poem tonight. And uh, I was just, I considered a success then because I didn't have a heart attack and die on the spot. So this is as far as I've come. And it, it, it didn't improve much, but I still don't die. I don't have a fear of going to die. Anyway, so. Uh, 
related to that, this poem is about uh, social anxiety, uh, extreme like, shyness and awkwardness and all of that, which is why I never would read my stuff. And it's about kind of any excuse, though people are like me, introverted and anxious, will make any excuse to get out of a social situation and tell any kind of lie. Like, I just have to get out of here right now. And, uh, but most people, when I read this poem, they always want to talk to me about beer because I think the poem's about beer. And uh, that's because I called it, I don't like beer. So here it is. They call me a misanthrope and mock my isolation. I like solitude, but I don't hate human interaction. I want to hear your stories, your dreams and travails. I want to share your secrets, just not your pal-ales. I think we could be soulmates, but there's so much I want to hear. I want to talk for hours. I do not want another beer. I'd love to learn about cricket, rugby, snooker, and yes, football. They require much more concentration and skill than any American sports at all. I know your team's usually a contender, but this season they've had bad luck. The refs are all on the tape. The new management sucks. I'm looking forward to learning about scoring and champions cheers. God, I want to learn all the team statistics, but I don't like beer. Yes, the weather's really crap, but tomorrow's supposed to be fine. It hasn't been clear for a week, but at least the snow has been light. In another month or so, it'll be nothing but steady rain. You should have bought that cottage your cousin sold in Spain. I'd like to learn more about what's changing the atmosphere, but I'm going to be running home soon, because I don't like beer. It's a beautiful grandbaby. She'll probably play for United. And that's a lovely cram you bought. I can tell you're excited. You've every reason to be proud. I think she's the spit of you. It sounds like the delivery was tough going there for a few. I want to hear more about how death is always near. I'd love to stay to death unto it, but I don't like beer. I'm sorry I don't like beer. I think it's something genetic. It's just too bitter for me, but otherwise we're copacetic. It's not that I'm a loner and wallow in desolation. You're a great companion, leader, and inspiration. I think you're just great, but I have to get out of here. I love people. I really, really do. But I don't like beer. <laughs> so during the lockdown, a lot of people wrote books. I, I, people wrote books and plays, and I made movies. They did all kinds of stuff. They came out with, with uh, albums, and I couldn't do anything. I, it just shut me down when, the, when it came. And, so it's the small triumph. So this one's just, I managed to do this. It's a small, about small triumphs. Some people are never satisfied. I swear, if they won the Pulitzer Prize, they complain it wasn't a Nobel. Sometimes the small triumphs mean the most, like not rereading the hateful email your ex sent to all your mutual friends, or when you didn't leave the crumbs on the counter after eating the last slice of key lime pie from your hands. It's about all <laughs> In my past life, I taught philosophy at a community college, and community college students, you know, stereotypically, and maybe there's a reason for the stereotype, aren't always that motivated into the material. Some of them were. I, I had some of the best students in the world, but uh, there's always a couple of students who are like, uh, they just disagree with everything you say. And if you're teaching philosophy, most philosophy teachers, I don't think I'm the only one, you tend to teach in opposites, so you do like rationalism and empiricism materialism and then uh, idealism. And so if you disagree with both of them, you violated the law of the excluded middle, which I, I always assume everybody knows everything, but my wife has told me that not everybody has had a philosophy class. So <laughs> I will explain that in philosophy, you have premises or propositions that are frequently referred to as P. So proposition P, so we say, if P is true, then Q can't be true, or something like that. So you have P and Q. And the law of the excluded uh, metal says something can't be P and not P. It has to be either P or not P. And so um, that's the law of the excluded metal. So if you disagree with P and then disagree with not P, you've contradicted yourself. <coughs> so anyway, I wrote this poem about the classroom contrarian. It involves P's and Q's, and that's why I had to explain about proposition <laughs> P and proposition Q. So here's the poem. Classroom contrarian. I think P is stupid, and not P is equally absurd, and Q is the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. That's it. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> and I actually, I don't really like any of my poems, but that sort of really sums up about 80% of my students. <laughs> so, uh, this next one, 
I have been cut, not fully, I was never fully estranged from my sons. They're 30 and 33 years old now, but I was kind of estranged from them. So like Father's Day and birthdays and stuff, I was lucky to get a happy birthday or, you know, happy Father's Day. It was the most I would get as a text. I never got a card or a gift or anything. And things are warming up. And so this year, for Father's Day, I got a cutting board uh, for the kitchen and it has these little trays that slide up. They never had a cutting board with little trays. And so I got really excited and I told my wife, I said, I can chop things up here. And somebody comes in, I don't want them to know what I'm chopping. I put it in his tray as a secret. <laughs> and she said, why would that be a secret? And I said, I just, I, nobody has to know what I'm doing. It's the one thing I do, nobody knows about it. And she said, that's not the, the purpose. It's not supposed to be a secret. And I said, but... The, you know, the world today doesn't have any privacy. There's no privacy. So if you can have a secret, you have to hang on to it. And so this is the last one I'm going to do, and it's called Secrets. She was explaining secrecy and privacy to the children. She said it was no secret that she used the toilet, but anything she did there was private by general assent. And I stand under a yellow light before a nosy and speckled mirror as the indifference of the room mocks me, my disappointment and my failing body rises. I flex random muscles to see whether they can respond at all or have the saggy pecs and flaccid abs lost all interest in my will. As resignation fills my eyes, I start when I see the window open to an empty dust, only dread and a stray cat searching for scraps of sustenance peer in. I sheepishly sidle over and draw the shade. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Randy. Next one up is Carl Wilder. But just another little thought I've had while I was sitting there watching the poets. Although I see, I, I feel like I know all of, all of the poets who are born tonight because they're poets and spoken words. I think I feel I know them quite well. There are a number of them that I've never met before, <laughs> <laughs> apart from on the screen. So, and it's quite a strange feeling that uh, I feel like you know them quite well. But uh, glad to be able to meet them in person as well. That's just the invitation as well, isn't it? Yes. Carl, thank you. Yours. Uh, I've got three clones tonight, uh, all based around pubs. <laughs> um, coincidentally, um, it would have been, today would have been my dad's birthday. Um, he was born in a pub. Uh, he works in local pubs, uh, and he spends a bit of leisure time in pubs as well. <laughs> so, the salutation. Let us raise our ales to the British Queen, the Prince of Wales, and the Nelly Dean. Drinking the charms of Princess Arms, the bag of nails, and the fiddler's green. Plough in with a round that the fox goes free, for the rose and crown have a drink on me. One under the eight at the hanging gate. So bald headed to town with a mark with the Grammy. Crawl from the longest to the shortest in Stady Bridge. Fight to the highest on Townhill Ridge. For the seven seas sail three sheep to their knees, and the travellers rest, then horse and carriage. Be in the honeycomb, and the forge and flagon, call them the dog and bone, and the Georgian dragon. But should you fail to remember that the sun in September's not the old house at home, pop in the wagon. So I lift the latch on the rubber dub dub, sit down the hatch at the working men's club, sink a few beers, sing and cry cheers, for there's really no match for the great British pub. <laughs> uh, this one's called Last Orders, and it's after Graham Swift, the uh, Graham Swift book, they make a film of it um, sometime later. Martin Kane, Bob Hoskins is in it, Tom Courtney. But a group of men who used to drink in the coaching horses in South London. Um, and this is in the form of a villanelle. Last orders. It ain't like your regular sort of day, despite the usual day, drinks, and camaraderie. Last orders, then time, are rung out this way. There's Lenny, and Victor, and Vincy, and Ray. Although they meet at the coach, meet at the coach in Bermondsey, it ain't like your regular sort of day. They lift their whiskey. Here's to Jack, they say, from the box on the bar and the dust to the sea. Last orders, then time, are run out this way. 
It's not for the pints, but respect they pay, they pay. To his words, few blokes would die of thirst if it wasn't for me. It ain't like your regular sort of day. His final wish to be scattered away from Margate Pier by Chatham and Canterbury, last ordered, then time, are rung out this way. Fear, grief and laughter, the olden days, war, wind and rain, all through exalted company. It ain't like your regular sort of day. Last orders, then time, are rung out this way. Thank you very much. Um, this one, this was inspired by um, those beautiful ornate windows uh, you get in front of Some pubs have still got them. And they're kind of frosted glass. They might have um, saloon or tap room. Very anonymous. This one's called the smoke room. They're calling time on it now, she said. It'll all be flat soon. She said this with her back to me, on tiptoe, reaching up, replacing the dried mug on the shelf. I let her tell me. I wanted to tell her I came home with a frosted pain, rescued from the sight. The same pain I peered through myriad times to get his attention, then fetch him back, like the chance had slipped well before and he grasped. I'd wandered past, pining to feel what I could see. The soulless shell, the hollow holes that showed so much less than what was other time obscured and echoed more. It was more profound, was more mysterious than even liquid glass. The hammer blows that overflowed from those once enticing barroom doors. The drilled rough bores, upended floors, no more the source of raucous roars where ales were poured and cast disgorged. That slate the thirst and soothed the words dispersed from crimson cushioned stalls and softened ruby stalled open panelled walls with mirth. In passing, I stopped and saw the window that was so long my hinted view of his lost world. The fogged and frosted glass that shielded him from passers' casual gaze. The unedged letters, smooth as stout and clear as gin. The smoke room through which I saw how he was him. Awkward, angled against the torn out timber and brick back debris. The familiar barely assembled in my eye before the builder's bucket of random rubble crushed the prone pane and filtered its filaments down through the gaps of years and settled in the dust strewn scraps sunk at the bottom of the skip. How it shattered and skittered that persistent wave of worry. Worry that my frantic tapping with the milk edge, errand urn, journey boy coin might scratch or crack that precious etched Victoriana. In those bottle green days, I'd wrapped and waved, scarce seen from within. Whether emergency or mundanity, this childish urgency tugged attention from my fingers, feverishly pulling me up as my feet slipped for foothold on the graded plinth that ran the pub's perimeter. Then served joy of caught glimpse through the white clean glass, the two whole view of him, laughing, with other men. Post throw, the dust chap chalked up score, or my hollow disappointment at the empty chair. Anticipation stoked by the half smoked bag in the butt and dotted dent ashtray beside his back of pouch and matches. To wish so hard it hurt my eyes. He never saw me first, I always had to tap, sometimes frantic yet not too loud, or someone going in would clock my look and serve, shall I give him a shout? I'd nod as door swung open with a hiss of escaping bellows and ballyhoo and clinking glasses and scraping chairs, another swallowed man. While I'd wait and wonder if the message was met or missed, still keen not to be seen by stony staff or watchful host. So I'd stretch myself again and whack and wave until when ready, he'd raise his face and wink and down the pint. The dread slow sliding down the glass and wipe his mouth and fetch his bags and coat and collar up. Then once outside it would be hands in pockets. So what's the tea? She was sugar on, I'd say to beat him to it, and he'd swiftly flick my neck with the back of his fingers. We'd pass the smoke room sign without a second glance and tapping out a final bag, he lights up. When you look through that window, you look like you're wearing glasses. He smirks and snorts, the perfect plumes of 
Blue Grace Monk. Who 
they named those shapeless heathen devoid of civilized truth. They were the great people of that piece of Jews like Mother Earth herself. Repentance was required by missionary zeal for ignorance and sin. A few remain the pride of survivors of the greedy outlook to take abuse and fence the land, to dominate and control. A few remain, a few, and those of us who seek another way to restore the paradise we have. And this last one, a bit shorter, <laughs> I wrote this on the day of George Floyd's death, 25th of May, 2020. Our planet breathed while COVID took its toll. I didn't tell the disciples, hair wisdom, but honouring the wisdom of animals, I'm going to start again. Hair wisdom, thank you. Our planet breathed while COVID took its toll. And hair, her senses honed. She offered up a prayer of thanks for getting through another night. Whilst over there, George Floyd was murdered in plain sight. Hair shuddered as she felt the thud and prayed again for us, the humans, who have yet another death to signal inequality and beg in our lives. If only each of us could own our long inherited prejudice, the part of me disowned. The little voice that asks, why aren't you more like me? The sheep and goats, the black and white, the us and them that splinter humans from our shared reality. The differences of colour, class and creed that hold us in a lockdown carved so cleverly by those who gain from keeping us apart. A wily fox distracts us in the night to make us kill, but hair entreats us all. Look up, look up and see the moon. Care for the earth and all that is Outwit the foxes. Realize we breathe as one. Thank you. Thank you, Maggie. Next up is Mark Thompson. Buzzard we cannot 
the sea. A buzz of work from the wind over a barrow mound on bare limestone hills seems for one instant independent of space, free of gravity's constraints. How faint the wind feather dip, the effortless slip down the curve of the breeze, the ease with which it moves from one stasis to another. More wonderful still the fact that it is suspended neither time nor space, nor does it move through space and time. Neither truly exists free of the other. Rather, it is itself both space and time. Each bone, each muscle and undulation in the same field, the rhyme set in minor jumps from one beat to another, to a pattern we only dimly discover. The glide of the buzzard over the cusp of a hill, the ride of the air's uplift, is not the movement of one object against another, witnessed by us in wonder, but instead is a shift in relationship, a ceaseless drift in the arrangement of particles that are themselves always and everywhere the same, but different in the same way. Like a short-sighted man squinting at a page, we walk our lives in an approximate haze, the information available to our gaze so scans that only the muddled sum of a myriad indeterminate trajectories add up to the beauty of seeing that buzzard slide with such majesty, that ease, down the slope of the wind. Some of you might know of a town called Leek, just down the road. It's, um, it's written about that town, which is where I am. Red Town. How it waves on me some days, this red town, the sullen smear of carmine on every wall, the ferrous pall of rust across dead ground. In this town all the hues are found, but only red. Wearily I tread Basquerade at alleys, close-knit, dread the relentless clamber of brick on bruised brick. And tall above me chimney tops blood, high like pillars of gore. Sometimes I see this some days I see this town hematite, others sustain of all courses through my veins. My eyes in flame now over the sore. On those days in this town, how I would draw down the cool hill greys, the green springs clean my eyes and soothe my bloodshot gaze. Fog-filled streets of Manchester. It's called The 
third umbrella, the rest of the It was 10 p.m. on October the 22nd, 1906. The damp dark was clamping down on the town, filling the streets with that dank, unpleasant odor that all seemed to come with a heavy fog. Most of the inhabitants of the area had retired behind closed doors. Patches of light pushed back the darkness to some small degree as each house lit the lamps and closed the curtains to keep out the fog. Perhaps not only the fog. The final few passers-by, coughing heavily, were in rushing mode, heading for the warmth and the safety of their own front door. The church clock could be heard telling anyone who was listening that it was now 10 p.m. and time to get under cover. It was now the danger, if danger was alive this night, could rear its head. A small distance away, the sounds of hurried footsteps, a woman's footsteps, could be heard stumbling and scratching the pavement as she lurched full of ale towards her bed in the attic. Her hoarse breathing could be heard getting closer. The sound was that of the dark shadow that was, was the Red Death had been waiting for. It was having trouble controlling its own breathing. The killer was becoming quite eager. The strange assassin had positioned itself seductively in the shelter of two large gateposts, so they could be seen and recognized, but not what it really was. Footsteps drew near, and as its plaything got closer, the Red Death readied itself for the murderous moment. <clears throat> the shape of the woman emerged from the thick, wet blanket of fog. As she, saw, as she saw what was waiting for her, she stopped and stood there, swaying, unafraid. Owing partially to the fact that the alcohol she'd consumed had now laid its stupidity hands on her. The waiting killer leant nonchalantly against the gatepost, displaying a touch of elegance that just begged for reaction. He got it. The woman bent over unsteadily to see what was there. Reaching down, she picked the thing up. Oh, aren't you just beautiful? She asked. You know you shouldn't be out here all alone. What are you doing here all by yourself in this fog? Oh, we just what I always wanted. Who owned you, my lovely? The poor drunken rabbit looked around uncertain. There's no one here. Around here, she mumbled. So you're coming home with me tonight. She giggled. The Red Death, amused by the pun about nobody, grinned its toothless grin and waited impatiently for the moment of a messy death to arrive. As a woman picked him up, the Red Death opened his canopy and, snapping it shut, tightened all the spokes of the umbrella around her neck and throat. The woman began to scream and smoke and chutter and splutter and fight, till she finally expired in a beer tainted flurry of panic and shortage of breath, then lay strangled, deflated like a discarded balloon, dead in the mud. From out of the darkness came the measured sound of heavy footsteps. Who could it be but a local policeman? He was a stolid man who moved as always in a solid, measured manner. Nothing could disturb this man's equilibrium. Oh, yes. Yeah. He moved closer to the scene of the crime until, Well, 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 what are we here? He asked no one in particular. Now here was a man accustomed to asking impossible questions from anything or anyone. A bird, a lumpers, even a dead body. He never expected to get any answer. So wasn't dis disappointed when it didn't arrive. He about to be startled the minion of the law shone his lamp upon the grisly scene between the guest boat, the gate post, Da da dum bum should be a sound here, really. But. Well, it was his own fault. Instructions from the inspector were don't forget. Come on. If you find the body, first enter all details in your notebook. Two, don't touch anything. And three, immediately someone help with your whistle from the intelligentsia, the detectives. That this foolish policeman forgot. Bending closer for a better view, he ended up. He'd seen the umbrella, seemingly knotted around the throat of the victim, and being of slightly curious nature, asked, What the hell is this thing here doing lying down there with a red brolly around it, call it? The umbrella sniggered and muttered itself, 
is in the law. The officer of the law sees hold of the brother, just checking to see if the corpse was a corpse, and of course it was. <coughs> what the officer of the law had to overlook was that the old murderer could still be there. As the poor BC bent over for a second look, the emperor released his hold on the woman, and the red canopy sprang open again and went into reverse gear. It wrapped itself around the PC's throat, tightened its grip, and in just 48 and three quarter seconds, body number two was leaning in a quite comfortable dead position, snuggled up shamelessly against the dead woman. Not a drunk this time, but a dead representative of the city police. So, now we have a dead drunken woman and a dead representative of the city police, both wrapped up in each other, being gently washed by the thick damp cloth. And not a killer in sight. And you, you can imagine the fuss and bother that ensued. Horrific umbrella murders screamed at your headlines. Two murdered bodies found beside a red umbrella. No clues. Well, really, the papers had a feel, eh? Everybody had a solution, apart from the correct one. The town was searched from attic to sewer over several weeks, but with no obvious clues, the police were totally baffled. Trial of Bones was consulted, but got nowhere, and gradually, case was relegated to the what do we do next file in the unsolved room. The bodies were buried and the umbrella was put on a shelf all by itself in the lack of evidence room. After a time there came reports from the night shift that hideous chuckles could be heard coming from the lack of evidence room late at night. But that was proven to be Constable Maggie Peters and Constable James Hoffling taking their invest investigations into police procedures under Fog continued to cause problems for the asthmatics in the town. Then one evening, one morning, when the officer who looked after old evidence went in for a crafty smoke with his charges, only to find the red umbrella gone. Disappeared. Done a bunk. Never to be seen again. Maybe. There was, of course, an umbrella which came to nothing. The nasty rumours that the station charge was pretty and white had been seen with a red umbrella or examined, but it came to nothing. And then the whole thing died, if you forgive me, a death. And yet, and yet, I have an uneasy feeling that somewhere this murderous umbrella is lurking, not far away, <laughs> waiting for a propitious moment to strike, to <coughs> strangle again. So, don't forget, as you walk home tonight, <coughs> and as it's getting darker, but that perhaps this could be your moment to be alone with the Red Umbrella. Sleep well. <laughs> now, I appreciate that there might be someone out there, some disbeliever out there, listening to this who will be prompted to say, Oh, silly, an umbrella committing murders and then escaping with no trace. Rubbish. For you, all of you, I've got ten seconds in which to solve the problem. Let's start. This is a story, and I can make my story, but I do what I want. <laughs> I hope you've enjoyed this flight of fancy. If you didn't, my name is uh, Boris Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> if you did, it's Ken Smith. <laughs>
and apple wines to flower late, to face the frost, and apples turned to gold to fortunes made. Apples birthed and bred, revered, nurtured, college cuddling, Woolbrook dipping, opalescent, violet, Victoria, an early fruit, and some too poor to hold a tale, named small, strung tags on wire. But in this rainless season, a dirt, too little fruit to pick. So pick and choose your apples wisely, beware the Ten Commandments. Emile Heath thrives here. Her leaves in autumn wane, no sign of fruit. Take satisfaction, laughter, praise this place. This timeless garden walled in Cheshire brick. It's gardeners who tend your every need, who plant your every virgin seed. There is an apple orchard in a brook, in a book, a far dim fantasy, where milkmaids sat the summer long and ate their fruit, whilst Martin Pippin told to each a tale. <laughs> the next two are from my book, Mapple Moon Perimeter. Some of you got flyers on the table. And I've got a few copies if anyone's interested. Um, the first of these two goes back six years, which is actually relevant because the dates feature in this. It was written in 2015 um, after a visit to Georgia's Bank, um, and it was a, a, a talk um, by Alan Garner. So it's jovial, remembering Bernard Lovell and celebrating Alan Garner. We gathered here within the only room his presence hasn't left its mark. The year feels out of sync, one less and we'd be 57 years beyond the great unveiling. The same place and time, a burial mound beyond the boundary blast of southbound trains, embrace the writer to its heart and heart. And if the rest is history, what truth does that relate? One more word in a list already over long? Of more significance, the growth of books that germinate are birthed beside the field where Roman soldiers linger still. Though they are young compared to some whose lives unraveled on this corner of the Cheshire Plain. They left their mark. We all do. Some of mine are here. The year 1957 pinpoints this existence too. This place unfolds its resonance as well. If we could tune an ear to earth and hear the songs of soil and stone, if we would turn eyes skyward, leaving on the ground the stuff that scholars teach and filter out time's limitations, drawn in lines so literal we cannot cross, then we might also hear and see the stories that this place its people tell. <laughs> and the last one was written um, about Lindo Moss and Lindo Lamb and a small um, celebration to mark Lammas. Moss Man at Lammas. I thought I saw you there, out on the moss tonight. A silver grape caught in the light of blue and grey ripe moon. Saw you kneel, head bowed, hair longer than your reconstructed self. Bent low, a supplement, supplicant or sacrifice, wreathed in drifting mist of incense smoke. We light candles, join hands. Each in turn called waters invoke blessing, entreat peace and healing for our broken land. This place long shaped before you came to save a failing harvest or to span two severed worlds. 
your destiny to die on our sacred soil, to sink beneath the waters of a wasting land. We cut and share an apple, fruits of hope and early harvest, swallow down the flesh and core, prepare for transformation. second husband, Reg, liked to walk around the house naked. He shuddered at the thought of it. He must have thought I was too young to understand. I suppose I was. He came back to me this morning, standing in the bathroom shaving. That's your warm up. <laughs> okay? But there's a joy in writing and you forget it. That was just a moment, and I didn't want to leave it. It's just a pleasure for writing it. And I always like to start with an audience going, I've got you now. <laughs> some audiences get it immediately, and some audiences don't. <laughs> Which is what you've just done. <laughs> um, I thought since we're, in, since we're in the Peak District, I would just like to share with you a couple of points about war. I assume most of you enjoy walking on our walkers. Tell me so, but I have climbed and rambled where the walkers go. Cat bells, skibble, the dales, the chase, red pike, the grit stone face of Frogger's Edge. And with every climb, there, there is a sense of moving behind. Not of the grieving kind, for it touches something natural in man to be outdoors and seeking higher ground, to open the gate that leaves the road behind. Rather, it is a finding, a reminding of the grandeur of green and open space and cloud cotton heights that touch steep skies, where the larks and the backwinds weave you into a natural scheme. And always, To see a lane meandering along the valley floor, a tiny sheepdog in his yard, a farmhouse you can blot out with your thumb, is to come to see yourself, and to know and to enjoy your nothingness. I smile when I remember a certain rock to perch on, a spot beneath a tree, a view where, by sitting still, we begin to own it. I think of climbing such a hill or treading such a path, not as a going, but as a, a kind of coming home. A threshold crossed and knowing that such a place one's own cannot be lost. Sort of connection, really. Can I take it so you enjoy your gardening? Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I've got two garden clubs in this, this collection. Yeah. One of them's called, I, I love my garden, I could sit in it all day. Um, and that's the truth of it. This is the other <laughs> thing, which, which I'd like to know. <coughs> uh, garden. Mm. I, I think I understand. 
understand that. The fact of it. A palette of reds and pinks, the bruise of grey piercings. A canvas of green with copper shrubs and the rain soaked shed tucked away. A French deal. And you, that's my wife, man. Okay. <laughs> and you, out there playing God, pruning deadheading geraniums, receding and potting out sweet peas, your hands digging in and sifting soil or cutting relentless grass. But I cannot find affection for a matter of it, or pause to wonder at a crocus, or delight in a rose that smells of soap. I cannot feel cross with a slug surviving in the thicket of things. Uh, God might have been a gardener, but he is up there with binoculars. Eyes trained on huge patches of trees, long ranges of peaks, the blue horizon. The big picture is his. And if you feel in your bones, swell and the call of the sea, the pull of geology, the weight and the thrust of rock and the height and the winds of it, then a garden is just not for me. Safety. The 
We step to hot plates. They scold our feet as we run. Here are the minutes of our last meeting. Here are the minutes of our last hours. Those responsible for the tragedy have been replaced. Those affected by it can't be. Our condolence has rained down on you. We had no sprinklers to do the same. All efforts are being made to identify the causes. Hope vanishes from you ever identifying our corpses. Now we are ready to listen to your concerns. Our lips are sealed. Our unheard voices are in your files. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, thank you. I'll, I'll finish uh, with this one. A brief commercial first. Um, as the people who are selling books and things know that um, if you don't mention what you have to sell, you never sell them. You, you don't necessarily sell them when you do mention them. But uh, yeah, so the, I'm reading a piece from this latest collection. It was a, a prize winning collection called Love and Crossbones, and it's a couple of pliers and, uh, and uh, another book I've brought tonight. I will just quickly mention this, which I'm doing a, a launch for in a, in a couple of weeks, a much belated launch for this album of songs of mine. Uh, I've got a band on it as well, Tricky Thieves and Luck. Uh, all proceeds from that, all £10 for those CDs, completely for lavish living booklet, and he's going to. And Macmillan's Cancer Trust. So um, if you're interested, I've got two copies with me. Um, and I'll finish with this one. Thanks for listening. Um, this is called Either Or. I believe I am destined forever to be unable to distinguish between swallows and swifts, moorhens and coots, and practice <laughs> and practice. <laughs> I forget as quickly as I learn the different tailed beaks, consonants, and the tricks to remember them by. I knew someone who was the same in numbers, who saw threes as eights, even with his glasses on, and who lost in his head and his mouth the registration of his just nicked car the moment he dialed 666 completely. <laughs> <laughs> well, neither of us stupid, I like to think. We just have these things that riddle us that many others cope with. We're rather like coots or moorheads in practice of light or young swifts executing their perfect figure threes in the night <laughs> swallowed sky. <laughs>
So I think some of these moments, they shouldn't be forgotten. And the moments that went before them shouldn't be forgotten either. So, many, many lives ago, how many lives? I don't know. Our granddaughter's ancestors walked in the sun and lived out their lives with each day's work done. African villages, African feet, dusty ground beneath African feet, sand dunes raised under clear blue skies, far away from white men's eyes. Then white men came with guns and whips, loaded thousands onto creaking ships, carried them over the rolling seas, chained and beaten to their knees. Worked them and beat them and worked them again, tea and cotton and sugar cane. Families working in Caribbean heat, dusty ground under black slaves' feet. The same sun beating from clear blue skies. Black people forced into slavish lives because white men believed that they had the right to own other people just because they weren't white. The right to make money, to live lives of ease on the backs of black people enslaved on their knees. Slaves forced to work Endless year after year, freedom, a word they forgot how to hear. No memories left of African roots. Generations enslaved under white men's boots. Broke down shacks, thread their clothes, singing African songs while they wielded their hoes. Dance to remember, drink to forget. Two hundred years and not ended yet. Black families were freed, but no jobs and no homes, no hope and no food, condemned to roam. Then a war to end the slavish trade, Yankee dreaming fortunes made. While black men, they still clean the streets and the homes of dirt from white men's feet. Cleaners, Street sweepers, work while you sleepers, and singers, musicians, professors, clinicians, even the POTUS with his first lady, shining a bright light into lives that were shady. Then the orange man came to plaster his name across buildings and billboards, placating the gun hordes of white men who dreamed of their superiority over black men, they forced into inferiority. The promise to make America great once again, spreading hatred and fear, division and pain. And our granddaughters, three black beauties so tall, African roots, but Americans all. Yankee girls from New York State, baseball and school proms, Facing racism and hate. My Minnesotan friend in tears as the city of his growing years lies in tatters, trashed and burned to ash, while white men sit back and rake in the cash. I can't breathe, the black man cries. Please, I can't breathe. And the black man dies because of a white man kneeling down, setting a black man's neck to the ground. I can't breathe, the black man cries. Please, I can't breathe. And George Floyd. Um, well, thank you 
for all the poets and writers and, and a varied evening. And I've got uh, three poems for you that uh, are new poems. I've not read any of them out before. Um, so uh, to, to finish what, you, what, what, you, what I hope you think has been a good evening. A few weeks ago, I, I um, was reading an article in, in the Guardian magazine or something about the um, concept of whether free will, free will exists or not. Uh, not something I'd really thought about before, but uh, it, was quite, it was quite interesting to consider the fact of whether free will exists or, or whether it doesn't, or whether it's all preordained. So that's what this is called, if free will does not exist. Pondering on the nature of free will, can I claim to be a poet still? Is it me that writes these words? Is it me that writes these lines? Are these my thoughts? Shall I change this phrase? Shall I move this line? Are these my words, or written by an unseen hand? Do I have no other part to play, acting out their every whim? Is my every action the work of an unknown deity, in which I don't believe? in which I choose not to believe. If free will does not exist, then why do I agonize over every single word, over every single thought and deed? Can I not just let things flow? What I do next, I cannot know. So am I not responsible for anything in my life? If free will does not exist, then why do I? <laughs> This is one I started quite a while ago, but I just sort of finished it off uh, about the walls we erect, and it's called Walls Come Tumbling Down. When will the walls come down, those barriers of division, those icons of isolation, those symbols of our fears, the cause of many tears, of families torn apart, of yet another broken heart, another orphan child, Another child, childless parent, digging in the rubble, listening for a heartbeat, a pocket of air in a life-preserving bubble. When will we learn to come together? They are us and we are them. Will we ever learn to fight the agents of violence and hate before it's too late? Stop them sowing division and confusion. They cannot win if denied your collusion. Let's not bomb and murder the other. Stay together, every sister and brother. Tear down the walls, tear down the fences. Come together, embrace one another. Before I read the last one, uh, a couple of thanks um, to Chris and Jim for looking after the drinks and serving the drinks. <laughs> Uh, Caroline, who uh, has uh, been working extremely hard over the last few weeks and will continue to do so in the next two or three weeks, I'm sure. But uh, we all owe Caroline a great debt for, for organising things and allowing this, organising this venue in, in the way that she does to allow us to use it and for the great events that are, are, are coming on starting yesterday and over the next two and a half weeks of the fringe. Thank you. I know she, she wants to make a couple of announcements after I finish this poem on, on about uh, events coming up that you may well be interested in. So I'll ask her to do that when I finish. But before I do that, uh, I've got this one last poem. poem. It's called The Green Man or Woman. He or she resides in many places, staring down, foliage-faced, a symbol of rebirth and how we need it now. She is the transcendental goddess of divinity, death and renewal, a life force which cannot be denied. He heralds a new spring, bringing new life, new hope, new growth, a long, long winter hastening to a verdant end. 
Jack in the Green, a green knight, even Robin Hood, but always, always a green man. When next you venture into the woods of Buxton, you may catch a fleeting glimpse from the corner of your eye. A knotted piece of nature's art, or was it eyes, a nose, a mouth? Was it the rustling of the leaves, or whispered words of hope? Be glad that you were there. Be glad you felt that link with ancient times, and let your mind grow wide. Come back to this shrine. Come back with vigour renewed. Come back whenever you can and give your thanks to the green man. A gallery of wondrous beauty, of creative art, of creative words and music too. This green man, or woman, this cherished temple of imagination. Have a safe journey home and look forward to doing it again sometime. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Can I just say thanks to Don who organises yeah. it all? Absolutely. So well. yeah. <laughs>
not stick in the mud about certain things, but he's he's got a lovely reading voice. He reads the Anglo-Saxon. It's not all Anglo-Saxon. It's about everything in, in English poetry. But listening to your rhythms today, I, I just made me think. I think these are the guys who would enjoy and be interested in what Michael's doing. Um, if you pick up one of our um, what's on leaflets. I haven't got a detailed listing in there, but the dates of all of our shows are in there. Um, and if you go to the Fringe website, you can find the, the full listings. Um, you're very privileged now. You've got the chair of the Fringe doing the review. <laughs> so I'd let you know. <laughs> Who is also a lover of words. I know that. Um, so anyway, but thank you for a really wonderful, wonderful evening. And thank you for those tributes to the Green Man. Um, if you want to know the real origin of the name of the Green Man, I will tell you, but um, it wasn't that. <laughs> but it's sort of, we've kind of grown into the name in all sorts of different and interesting ways. And the Green Man is definitely one of my, um, uh, you know, learning more about and the myths and our idea of the Green Man. <coughs> I want more poetry here.